Jim, you anticipated the Bloomberg question of the day today, which is how far can east-west stocks divergence go? You can be one of our first respondents. OK, so one of the metrics that we look at is we look at the P.E. To, to growth metric. And if you look at Chinese markets relative to the U.S., I think it's widely known that China's trading on a very material discount. So our numbers suggest that China's trading right now on a P.E. of about 15 times, whereas the U.S. is trading on about 23 times. But what's interesting is that despite the fact you pay so much less for Chinese equities, let's say a 30% discount, you get more earnings growth. So the second derivative of that equation is the P.E. growth estimate. And in this case, we think that the P.E. growth multiple for China is actually 80% less than it is for the U.S. So, so you get so much more for your money. That's something which we think will factor in over the course of the next few months and years. You say investors don't have enough exposure to China, but are there risks, though, that investors may be considering? And I'm thinking, for example, there's been a lot of headlines around the China tech crackdown. That might make investors wary. And we've been hearing today from uh, Daco, a, a solar panel manufacturer in Xinjiang today, that's refusing to take part in the labour program. And we're sort of wondering if uh, the government might have something to say about that as well. So are these the sorts of risks that are turning investors off? Yes, I think that's definitely the case. And if you look at your traditional global investor who's located in New York or San Francisco or London, then typically that investor will have less than 5% of global portfolios sitting in China's debt or China equity. And that is relatively modest compared to China's share of world GDP, which is 17%. So what we think from a risk diversification point of view, you can buy exposure to China by being invested in Apple or, or some leading US companies. But to get direct exposure to China's economy, which is still growing faster than any other major developed economy, you need to be invested in China domestic stocks. And that, from a risk diversification point of view, means that global investors should not have 5% in China, they should have 10 or 15%. So they're meaningfully underweight, which from a risk perspective, I think is too big. And Jim, we've just heard uh, from Taiwan's exchange that the COVID development is controllable and they're asking investors not to overreact. Uh, this really caught my eye, given what happened last week, that they felt the need to come out and tell investors not to overreact. I mean, how bad could it get? Well, I think we're seeing this in lots of markets. It's not unique to Taiwan. It's not unique to China. We're seeing it with the Fed. We're seeing it with the Bank of England. You've got central banks. You've got lots of policymakers intervening in, in private markets. So, for example, back in 1997, we had the HKMA buy equities here. Uh, the BOJ, of course, has invested in the Japanese stock market. You've got local pension funds like the GPIF owning 8% of the Japanese equity market. So I think you've got lots of actors involved in this. And be mindful that the stock market for a country like Taiwan or a country like China, it's almost an indication of soft power. Again, looking at global portfolios, TSMC, which is 40% of the Taiwanese stock market, is in all big investors' portfolios. So I think from a, a soft power perspective, the value of the stock market is a barometer of the health of the economy and to a certain extent society. So these governments around the world will do their best to, to, to help them. We saw really a lot of downside pressure on semiconductors and tech stocks last week, given the rotation into cyclicals. Can we expect to, them to make a, uh, a comeback, given the long-term narrative that we're really short of chips? Yes, I think we can. I mean, ultimately, stock markets rotate. They go from value into growth from time to time. Uh, we see more interest from the client base that we talk to in some of the, let's say, the most more boring sectors, which are banks and financials. But these things come and go. I think what we've got in tech, uh, for example, a TSMC, the stock I just referenced, not only do you have a stock which has got earnings growth of, of 20% for a company of that magnitude is, is quite enormous. You've also got very decent dividend support. So I think tech gives you two things. <clears throat> it gives you growth, but also at a time of low bond deals, it gives you income. And Japan has also been a favorite given its cyclical nature and AGM season is here. What can we expect? So I think one thing to look for is more agitation from shareholders to see management change, asset disposals, or M&A. I know that domestic M&A has been a challenge for Japanese companies because getting uh, due diligence done during COVID times is quite difficult because moving around the country, checking out factories or plants is just really difficult with the COVID restrictions. But I think uh, we see investors get together with management. And if we see those investors start, start to challenge management on things like succession, on things like dividend policy, then that will give investors a lot more confidence.